All right. <laughs> Calvary. <laughs> we are back in the room. We never left. People all say, oh, we get to go back to church. I go, come on, man. We've been in church. We've been out on the lawn, baby. Worshiping the Lord. The Spirit's been with us, and now we get to come back in here. Hey, do you like some of the uh, upgrades we made? We got some more screens and stuff like that. And uh, I was going to have a hydraulic jack underneath the stage with my pulpit, and I could just come up and... That's getting a little creepy and culty, but we'll talk about that later, all right? We'll talk about that later, because we're talking about truth this morning. We're talking about a truth encounter, and man, you know, what, what's the truth? And, and we're, in a, we're in an age of fake news, right, and fact-checking and all that stuff, and as I was preparing my message this week, I was trying to think back kind of through my life, you know, what, what are some of the movies where people had truth encounters. And of course, I started with Star Wars, right? Poor Luke Skywalker. <laughs> You're not my father. You know, that, was, that rocked his world, right? Darth Vader, his father. And then there was that movie with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson, A Few Good Men, if you remember that one. And Tom Cruise is this, this military lawyer, and Jack Nicholson is this colonel that probably got one of his men killed, and they're in the courtroom scene, and it's intense, and Jack Nicholson is on the stand, and Tom Cruise is, uh, is, is, is kind of asking him questions. Jack Nicholson says, what do you want? And what does Tom, Tom Cruise say? Truth. I want the truth. And what does Jack Nicholson say? Check that out. Everybody knows it. <laughs> exactly. You can't handle the truth, right? Now, I've given you a couple of examples, but the ultimate example, I think, in the history of movie cinema, of a truth encounter, is in the epic drama slash comedy, Elf with Will Ferrell. <laughs> Will, Ferrell, Will Ferrell plays Buddy the Elf, and he's in New York City, and he's got a job helping out in the, in the Christmas department at a big old department store, and all of a sudden, the, the department store Santa comes in, and he's all excited, Santa, Santa, and he gets up close to him, and he says, you're not Santa. You, Santa smells like candy canes. You smell like beef and cheese. <laughs> you sit on a throne of lies, you know, and the, the whole deal, right? Truth encounter. Well, we're talking about that this morning. You know, most of us have experienced personally that moment of truth when, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so excited, when somebody has, uh, <clears throat> has come clean with us. Or maybe when we've come clean with someone else, or we've shared a deep, dark secret and have never done that before. Or where a truth that we always held close to us is then revealed to be false, and those things can kind of rock our worlds. You know, I was thinking, as Jesus was standing before <coughs> Pilate, as he was being falsely accused. Pilate, being a Roman, philosophically asked the question to Jesus, what is truth? And ironically, the truth was standing right before him in the flesh. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so this morning, in our study through the book of Acts, that we've called the movement, watching how the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and how the church exploded, fulfilling the mission that Jesus had given them, we find a truth encounter today. A guy named Simon, who was a magician, perhaps a sorcerer, who had huh, an encounter with one of the early leaders of the church, a man full of the Holy Spirit and faith named Philip. And it's pretty incredible. 
and it rocked this guy's world. And I think it's a reminder for all of us, you know, what is the truth? How do we seek the truth? How do we know the truth? Because there's all sorts of different influences coming at us on a daily basis proclaiming their version of the truth, whatever that might be. And I pray that before we're done this morning, that we would remember the importance of always turning back to the truth of God's word and his son, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Let's talk with God. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for today, for this opportunity to return inside. I thank you for the opportunity of worshiping you and of learning from your word. God, in a day where things can be so confusing, so many messages are coming at us from each and every direction, and we're trying to filter out what's true, what's not. God, help us to have discerning hearts led by your Holy Spirit. Speak to us today through your word. In your name we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Well, I think there's going to be some lessons that's going to be helpful to each one of us this morning through this truth encounter we're going to look at between Simon and Philip. And the first is this, if you've got your notes, this is where we're filling it in. Beware, power without truth can be dangerous. Power without truth can be dangerous. Now, Stephen, as you remember last week, one of the first deacons of the church, and Philip was also a deacon, but Stephen was murdered. And because he was murdered, there were those early Jewish Christians that scattered out. And this was actually part of God's plan. And, 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 and the gospel was taken to different regions. Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the remotest parts of the world. And so <clears throat> a man named Philip went down to Samaria. And some weird things were happening in Samaria. Samaria was about a 40 mile walk from Jerusalem. And this picks up our story in verse 9 of Acts chapter 8. And it says this But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. So we're introduced to, uh, to Simon, and he's in the main city of Samaria, and he is able to do magic, and the people were amazed by his power. Now, what kind of magic did he do? Well, I'm not sure he was doing magic tricks like you and I are familiar with. Um, you know, I don't know, does anybody just like magic shows? Well, you're in a church. Don't put your hand up. That might not be good. But anyway, yeah, I've always been kind of fascinated by magicians, and I, I kind of love watching those shows. I love the magic shows on TV where they tell you how the trick was done, right? I'm that guy. Like, I want to know how that happened. And I remember watching some of those shows, and, and there's the old trick where there's a woman in a box, and she gets sawed in two. I remember in the past, I was just like, no way. No way. And then they showed how the trick was done, right? Spoiler alert, if you haven't been watching TV for the last 50 years. Anyway, um, she's all crumpled up in one section of the box, and they got fake feet on the other side. And that's how the magician can, can saw her in two. And when I first thought of it, I was like, <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. And then there's those tricks where people levitate. Have you ever seen that? And they've got a hula hoop. And the magician, you know, someone's, someone's sitting there like this. And then uh, they, uh, they got a hula hoop to show you that there's nothing around it. But, but, but you know there's got to be like a metal rod sticking back there, right? And then they show you how the trick's done. Spoiler alert, okay, yeah, there is a metal rod. There's no way they could just levitate. 
but it's with mirrors and with how you twirl the hula hoop and all that. And, and anyway, I've been just amazed by some of these magic tricks. And whether this guy, Simon, over 2,000 years ago, was doing magic tricks to amaze the Samaritans, it doesn't really tell us. But he wasn't a magician like, you know, Houdini or David Copperfield. No, uh, he, he was doing something else. And so look what it says in verses 10 and 11. All the people paid attention to Simon from the least to the greatest. Whether you were the, a, a poor shepherd or you were a successful businessman or maybe a political leader, he had everybody in the palm of his hands. You've got to realize Simon held great power because of his magic. And this is what they said about him. This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Here's what I think was going on there. He was giving them a truth of his power, and they were crediting it to a godly power. But you know what he was doing? I think he was a sorcerer. I think the source of Simon's power was from evil spirits, from the enemy, not the Savior. He was dabbling with the occult, and he amazed them. The Bible says this in the book of Deuteronomy about people at that time who would do such things. And it says this in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 to 12. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. That was dealing with some of the pagan nations and how they worship their idol gods. And then it goes on. There shall not be found anyone among you who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. I think that's what Simon was doing. I think that's what Simon was about Folks, beware, power without truth can be dangerous. He had a whole city in the palm of his hand. Now, we're not unfamiliar with power that isn't based in truth. Back in the 70s, and especially in this Northern California area, many of you are familiar with uh, the Reverend Jim Jones and the People's Temple. He had disregarded God's word said it wasn't important. What was important is that people would look to him as their spiritual leader, look to him as their father, look to him as their God. He's quoted as saying that. He claimed that he had uh, superpowers to heal, and oftentimes he would deceive his people by having a little bag of uh, chicken organs and he would have someone come up and lay down on the table, and it was all planned ahead of time. And he would put his hand on like he had the power to heal, and he would lift out these chicken organs, saying, I have the cancer. I have the disease. And his people bought into it. But it just wasn't into, back in the 70s. This happens even today. Some of you maybe have heard of uh, a guy by the name of... Um, Keith Rainier, who was the founder of a cult called Nexim. He'd been working on it for about 20 years. He promoted it as a place where you can come for um, personal growth and self-help. You can um, gain self-awareness and become a more successful person. And as person after person after person bought into these lies, he became a person of manipulation. And eventually, here's what he would do to the women. He would actually brand his name onto their bodies and force them into sexual slavery. He's in jail right now, awaiting his sentence this month. 
Power without truth can be dangerous, and it still happens today. I can think of examples like the power of the media, the power of Hollywood, the power of our politicians, and yes, the power of cults. Listen, folks, Scripture calls us as children of God to what? To be discerning of the spirits. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 1, test the spirits to see if they are from God. The people in Samaria should have tested the spirits of Simon to see if he was truly from God, but they didn't do it and they were deceived. Folks, let me tell you something. Above the messages that our culture sends us, above the messages that our government or our politicians even send us, above some of the things that are taught contrary to God's word in our universities, above our media, is what? Is the truth of God's word. Is the truth of God's word. This is what we filter everything by and through. If you're a child of God, we don't worship God's word. We worship God and his son, Jesus Christ. But God has spoken to us through his son and through his word. Amen? Amen. And that's why we filter our culture. That's why we filter those who claim to be giving us a truth. We learn to filter it through God's word. Secondly, second lesson. We can learn through this story of Simon and Philip is this. We need to receive. We need to receive the power of God. Because the power of God's truth brings freedom. Freedom. Now, we've looked at Simon a little bit and his influence on the people of Samaria. Now we're going to look at God's servant, Philip. And it says this in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 8 in the book of Acts. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word of God. Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Philip was a co-worker with Stephen. And Philip took the 40-mile walk down from Jerusalem up north to Samaria. And what did he do? He proclaimed to them the Christ, the Messiah. The Samaritans were half-Jews. Their ancestors had allowed their pure faith in God to be mixed with other pagan religions. So they were pretty messed up. And Philip was coming to basically straighten them out. Listen, God loves you. And he sent his only son to die for you. The Messiah that we have waited for has come. And his name is Jesus. And that's what Philip was proclaiming. It goes on in verses 6 to 8. And the crowds, with one accord, what did they do? They paid attention to what Philip was saying. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, miraculous, unexplainable, an otherworldly sort of power, when they saw the signs that Philip did, And then it goes on, for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of of many people who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in the city. See, the, the Samaritans had been used to the false prophet Simon with his false Power, and now God sends one of his servants, Philip, and Philip demonstrates the power of God, preaching Jesus. Demons are coming out of people. People who are paralyzed can walk again. People who are lame are healed. And the people are seeing this power, these signs. And what did it say? You know, there there was much joy in the city. Much joy. Listen, you know, I've met so many Christians who are living like godless Samaritans. 
maybe enslaved to their culture or enslaved to immorality or practice dishonesty in their lives or maybe they have bitter hearts, won't forgive or they've turned to idolatry, you know, instead of, yeah, yeah, they go to church on Sundays, but the thing that's really got their heart is their bank account or their car or their boat or their homes or whatever it might be. It's a subtle form of idolatry. No. We need to receive the power of God's truth and live it. That's what brings freedom. Kirsten Powers found this out. Uh, Kirsten Powers said this. She said, if you told me that I would believe in God eight years ago, I would have laughed out loud in your face, especially if you were to tell me that I was going to be a Christian. She was beautiful. She was smart. But she was very prideful. She graduated from an esteemed college. She ended up working for six years um, in the Clinton administration in the White House. After that, she moved to New York, and she became uh, a writer and commentator on the Democratic uh, Party and politics. She described herself and her friends as intellectual atheists. And then she met a guy. She met a guy, and this guy happened to be a Christian, and this guy was one of the first people who started to challenge her intellectualism and her doubt in God, and he invited her to church, and she went with him, and he was going to redeem her church in New York City, pastored by Tim Keller. Maybe you've heard of him. And as she sat there, she started to listen to what this man was saying. And his whole mission is to take single, very highly educated, cynical people in New York and share with them the love of God. New York's one of the hardest soils to grow a church in the country, that in Seattle. Tim Keller, he's probably one of the most popularly read Christian authors today. He has cancer. You might want to pray for him. But his church is 7,000 people in the heart of New York. Then something tragic happened. Her and her boyfriend broke up. Oh, no. But you know what? Kirsten kept going to church. (laughs) She gave her life to Jesus. She started growing in her faith. And she said this, it's completely true. It was like a veil was lifted from my eyes and I could see the truth of God's love for me, she writes. The world looks so different to me now. I was free for the first time, and I felt indescribable joy. Isn't that cool? Not a big celebrity, not a household name, just this girl named Kirsten who had a truth encounter with God and a broader freedom. Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 8, Verses 31 and 32, he said to the Jews who had believed in him, You abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Who's the truth? Jesus Christ. Knowing Jesus and what he did for us, who he was, intellectually, step one. Getting into our heart, step two. Living it and acting it, step three. That's living in the truth. That's what's going to allow us to live in the freedom of Jesus Christ. And not be enslaved to all that other stuff that keeps coming at us from all directions, folks. Back to our story with Simon and Philip. So it says in Acts 8, 12, 
But when the Samaritans believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Isn't that awesome? So you got Simon over here, showed him powers and signs and miracles, but his power, I believe, was from Satan. And then you've got Philip healing, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and God's love for them. And they trusted Jesus. And they experienced the freedom of forgiveness, of sin, of healing through the word of God. And freedom in their lives. Amen. There's a third lesson that we can learn through this truth encounter. It's this. We need to examine. Are our hearts right before God? Do a self-examination. Ask yourself, is my heart right before God? So, here's Simon. He'd been with this these Samaritans a long time, and he had them in the palm of his hand. Philip comes in with the same sort of power, but he's preaching Jesus. And he sees these people give their lives to Jesus. See, he was witnessing in Philip's ministry a greater power than he had. He was witnessing in Philip's ministry a greater influence than he had. And look what the result was in verse 13 of Acts 8. Even Simon himself believed, Luke says. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And he grew in his faith. And he was sharing his faith with others. And and it was amazing, his growth in Christ. Do you see that? Doesn't say that, does it? I was tricking you, sorry. It says this. Philip was baptized. He kept hanging around Philip. Why? Because he kept watching the signs and the great miracles performed by Philip. And he was amazed. That's why Simon hung out with Philip. That's why Simon went along with the other Samaritans. Not because of Jesus. <laughs> but because of the tricks and the power and the signs and the wonders. So I asked the question, you know, was Simon's faith genuine? I would say, you know, God only knows, but I would say probably not. You know, as a youth pastor for many, many years, I understand the kumbaya moments. You know what I'm talking about? The kumbaya moments? Let me, let me define a kumbaya moment, okay? Okay. It's when you're at camp for a week with hundreds of teenagers and they're, they're building relationships with one another and they're sharing emotions and they're getting closer with Jesus. And I'm not, I'm not teasing summer camp. Summer camp is awesome, okay? But what happens is, is this, this intimacy can occur at a camp and God can do some incredible things. And then at the end, the last night of camp, what happens? The camp speaker gives an invitation to pe- for people to trust Jesus as their Savior, to repent of your sins. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Put him on the throne instead of yourself. And, and the band will be playing and the lights will come down and, and students will start coming forward. And I've seen it happen. A couple of students will go forward, and they'll look back, and their friends will be sitting there. And they'll walk a little further up front, and they'll look back, and finally one of the friends gets up and goes up. And they're all at the front, and there's tears, and there's emotion. And don't get me wrong, it's valid. It's valid. And I've seen many, many, many teenagers give their lives to Jesus Christ, praise the Lord, at these camps. But I've also seen... I've also seen, sometimes, on occasion, where some kids get caught up in the moment. You hear what I'm saying? They get caught up in the moment. Now, they're not really thinking through where they're at with God. They're not really (laughs) trusting Jesus as their Savior. They are moved by their emotions, and they say some words, 
but it really didn't take heart. And I've seen the aftermath of some of these young people when they've done that. And I've had to sit down with them and say, you know, about a year ago, you were at camp and you went forward, remember? And you made this commitment to Jesus, remember? Yeah, yeah. What's going on? Do you think that was real? Was your heart in the right place? Were you sincere in that decision that you made? A lot of times they'll say, you know, honestly, no. My heart wasn't in the right place. <laughs> and I've had some real sweet times in prayer with those kids. And then they've truly given their hearts to Jesus Christ. But Simon, I don't know. <laughs> so, the scene changes. Word gets back to Jerusalem that Philip was ministering and a bunch of Samaritans put their faith in Jesus and were baptized. Now, at that time, you have to realize this is the first time that, that the gospel has gone to, you know, like, non-Jews or half-Jews at the best. And so they sent Peter and John to go to Samaria to verify that these Samaritans had truly understood who Jesus was. And, and, then, and they were baptized. And then Peter and John laid their hands upon them. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon them. Now the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches us, comes at conversion. Not at baptism, at conversion. At that point when we trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we repent of our sins, baptism follows, but we have the Holy Spirit. At this point, the giving of the Holy Spirit uh, was held back. I'm going to say by God. Now you might say, but that's not how it works, Pastor. Hey, you know what? God can do whatever he wants. So I I'm going to leave it in God's hands. Is that okay? Can we do that? In this particular case, I think God held back just a moment, allowed Peter and John, the real deal, to go to Samaria, even though they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they put their hands upon them. It says the Holy Spirit came. God's God. I'm going to let him do his thing. All right? It was a unique situation, what happened there. And Simon is watching all this. And it says in verses 18 and 19, Now when Simon saw the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Listen, Simon isn't thinking about the Holy Spirit or salvation. He's thinking about the power and prestige he can get. And so he offers Peter money. Peter, John, I'll give you guys each 100 bucks if you give me the power, and then I can lay my hands, and they'll get, they'll get the Holy Spirit. Wrong thing to say. Check out verses 20 to 23. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. May your silver perish with you. Let me translate that. I pray you're not offended. You and your money can go to hell. That's what Peter's saying to him. That is basically what he is saying to him. Seriously, Simon? You think you can buy the power of God? Oh, the wickedness in your heart. Peter goes on in verse 21, you have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Underline it. Bam. Your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in, in the bond of iniquity. Wow. Wow. I think from Peter's perspective, Simon's conversion was not genuine at that time. He tells him, man, you better get right with God. Now, repent. And hopefully God will forgive you. Whew. 
And look at Simon's response. Verse 24, he can't even go to God himself. He's so far away from God and doesn't get it. Simon answers, pray for me to the Lord, Peter, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. He can't even humble himself and obey and do that. He gives it off to Peter. No, would you pray, you pray for me. I can't approach God. Man. Weak character. Weak faith. You know, I can relate, however, to Simon. There are times in my life when I have not had the right heart. In my relationships, in my motivations, my intentions, even in my ministry. There's a contrast to Simon in the book of Psalms. Words from a man named David. Where he said in Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What a contrast. Simon wanted to buy (laughs) the Holy Spirit from Peter. So that he might have the prestige and power demonstrated by a true follower of Jesus. His heart wasn't in the right place. He was messed up. He was confused. Caught in his own sin and wickedness and selfishness and pride. And then you have someone like David who, you know, up and down. And yet he's able to to get on his knees intimately and, and, and pray to his heavenly father. Search me, O God. Know my anxious thoughts. Search me. Penetrate deep inside. See if there be anything in me that is not of you. And let's get rid of it, God. That was David's heart. That's the heart I want to have. I pray that that's the kind of heart that you would want to have too, because that's where the truth is found when our hearts are right before God. We're living in the truth in all areas of our lives. I pray that your takeaway is, you know, not all those who claim to have the truth do, but we do. By the grace and glory of God, we have his word. And we can filter all things that come our way through the truth of God's word, based in the truth of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.